I know there's a lot going on in the world. So um, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll try to make this a really good learning environment. I'm excited about today's workshop. Um, let me start, start sharing these slides. Um, I'm pretty excited about today's workshop. Um, we're gonna be talking about the devices that we use and thinking about the ways that they sense the world around them, um, what kinds of risks that might pose to us and how we can control those things. Um, so, let's see. my first question for y'all, I, I saw people already did introduce themselves with names and pronouns and things. Uh, if you haven't, feel free to add that in the chat. And then also um, for my information and just so other people know too, please share um, what's one thing you're hoping to get out of this workshop today? New ideas for DigiSec practices, especially related to cameras and cell phones. To know more about biometric data. Great, yeah, I'm hoping folks here will also share your own practices because I'm sure that um, people have um, many ways of managing things that are, that may be different. I'll keep going, but feel free to add into the chat. Um, what you're most interested in today, something you're hoping to take away. Our goals are going to get, to try to get more familiar with the information that our computers and mobile phones are gathering through sensors um, and storing in various memory places on our, on our devices and on external media. And we're gonna try to learn how to manage this information more. So figuring out how to delete it, change it, and um, how to prevent our devices from collecting it in the first place. Um, and then we're gonna take a look around us and look a little bit wider in the rooms we're in and at the other devices around us. Um, people have, for instance, watches now that have a lot of sensors in them. Um, and we have things like speakers that might live in our house with, um, with microphones on them. So we're gonna take a look at that too and just start to, start to figure out how we could start to manage those sensors as well. Learning about where they are and how to delete data, how to stop them from uh, gathering data in the first place. Okay, so our agenda is, the first is gonna be a drawing exercise. Um, if you have a notebook and a pen near you, um, uh, you'll need one, <laughs> rather. Uh, and then we'll do this assessing process where we'll, we'll take a look at the devices that um, we all have in front of us. Um, I, have, I have instructions for managing more, many common devices um, and we can dig into specific questions you have too. Um, and then we'll, we'll start to look at, um, do another activity to look at sensors in our environments. So my first ask for you is to draw a picture of the computer that you're using and your phone. Um, this is what I would draw as I'm using a laptop and um, have a phone that looks kind of like that. Raj, thanks for sharing that you're interested in understanding biometric security and settling on a comfortable um, balance between convenience and privacy. Yeah, great. Okay, so if you've had a chance to draw sort of a stick figure version of your devices, actually, I think people are still sketchy. <laughs> Now the next thing we're gonna do is try to locate any cameras, microphones, headphone jacks, microphone jacks, biometric sensors, and memory. 
and label it. Just draw a circle around it and write its name. So when I tried to do that, mine looked something like this. Um, it was pretty clear to me where my cameras are. Or it's very clear. That's when something I knew. I knew where my headphone and mic jacks were. The fingerprint biometric sensor is really obvious on my computer. Um, things that were less obvious to me are the memory. So the hard drive in my computer, I actually don't know which side of my computer it's on. So I, I drew a sort of a circle here and labeled it. Um, similarly with my phone at this point, um, I assume it's somewhere in here in the main body. Um, and then I'm also aware that I have some removable memory. My SIM card has, is it capable of storing some data? And then I also have a removable um, tiny flash drive that's in my phone. Was it hard for you to find any of these items? Or easy? Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. What's a fingerprint sensor? Yeah, so a fingerprint sensor or a biometric sensor is, um, is a little, um, it, it just sort of looks like a little touch screen on many devices, like a very tiny touch screen. Um, and it's, it's mostly really just capable of reading something about as big as your finger. Cool, cool, thank you. Yeah, it's hard to find mics on computers. Yeah, not sure where the hard drive is. Yeah, and so our devices have a lot of sensors on them at, some, at, at this point. Um, uh, if we had drawn this picture, if we had drawn this picture a year and a half ago, there would have been no fingerprint sensor on my device. If we had drawn this picture, um, 15 years ago, there would have been one camera on my phone. <laughs> um, so these, these devices are all getting way more sensing capabilities over time. Um, and so we need to think about how we can control them and, um, and the fact that lots of different components, these sensors have, sorry, there's software on our devices that have access to different sensors. Um, so one way to turn them off, um, We'll take a look at software and hardware ways to turn them off. So my question for you all is in your, in your life and work, um, what, what are the risks to you um, of having sensors like these on your devices and how are you managing them? We are a relatively small group and if you're comfortable on micing yourself and speaking, um, please feel free. I can share a little okay. bit. Um, I know that um, the the mics on my computer and phone, just general risk of, I mean, I don't feel personally too concerned at the moment about um, being listened um, on by uh, state or security forces, but I have a lot of partners that certainly do. And um, so I always try to be mindful of, of their concerns when I'm speaking with them and, um, you know, have had cases where we just don't bring devices to meetings and stuff like that. And just generally try not to have any smart, like the whole internet of uh, smart or whatever it's called, or thing, whatever it's <laughs> yeah. called, it freaks me out enough that I just try not to. I just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So anyone else want to share how you're relating to these sensors? What risks you think they, they might be bringing? Uh, 
Um, a little bit similar for me, it's when I'm hanging out with activists that are doing some real like direct actions and when they say, oh, I know I'm on some lists and I'm like, I'm, I'm here with my phone right in front of me. And, you know, so I think not, you know, I'm not doing direct action work, um, but the folks that I'm around when they bring stuff up and um, work in different places, um, that's like my concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there. so there are a lot of direct risks to, to us when we're as activists. And then I think on a, um, on a like a broader sort of political scale and sometimes a um, larger social scale. Also, a lot of these devices are listening to us to figure out what our shopping habits are and to sort of classify us in that way. And that, that in the long term creates, um, it just further can, can further aggravate like inequities um, in broader society, which also of course feed back into um, issues that we need to organize, organize around and issues of justice. So um, there's sort of the direct and the, on the micro level and then a macro level impact, I think. Um, one note, Jack is taking notes in these slides and we'll share them later there. Um, uh, we'll, we'll share these slides later so that uh, people can have those too, those notes. Okay, so um, so the thing about not enga wanting to internet, uh, engage with the Internet of Things, I fully agree with that, uh, just in the sense that it is, um, as these sensors get embedded everywhere, my favorite technique is to just try to cover them up and, um, and, and mute them um, physically. And so what I want to do first is share physical ways of doing this. This is going to be our most... Um, probably one of our most foolproof ways of doing things. So we spoke a little bit about Pegasus last time. And um, when we have very well resourced opposition, like state, um, like state opposition or security forces, um, they're more likely to have the resources to get viruses and malware on our devices to be able to control things like our sensors without us noticing. Um, and so the best, the safest practice, of course, is to have those sensors not be in the room with us. But if, um, if say you're working on your computer, <laughs> which you might be most of the time, um, you can just cover up a camera with a sticky note or a camera cover. Um, I, at this point, I'm using a camera cover that has a little slideable lens on it. And I like it just because um, then you don't have to take, I, I don't have to replace a sticky note all the time, but a piece of taped paper will work uh, just as well. Um, it's good to, to put that on and test it. Some paper has different opacity. Um, so you will find that um, some of it is better or worse at covering up your camera. The same with stickers. Um, I've had some stickers sometimes with little designs on them and you should test um, to make sure that, that um, the light and image is not coming through parts of the design. Um, with microphones, you can cover up the microphones um, and somebody, I think it was Jack shared on chat that um, they, they were having a hard time finding their mic. And I also similarly have a hard time. Yeah, totally, Jackie. Also, the, these like specifically lens made stickers are designed with glue that doesn't gum up your video, your, your lens. So with mics, they're a little bit trickier um, because it's, it's often quite difficult to figure out which part of your, um, your device is sensing through, through a microphone. Um, so I wanna share the, the best way to take, um, make sure that your mic is not listening through hardware is by using a plug. So um, this might be familiar to folks. This is, um, this is the end part of a plug of a set of um, earbuds that I had with a microphone. So the thing you can see on it, it has three lines. There's a picture over here to the right as well. Um, the one with three lines, uh, sorry. And here's, here's the end of a set of um, earbuds that is only earbuds, no microphone. When it's just for earbuds, you have two lines, a left and a right channel. When it starts to have a microphone, you'll see three lines. So if you have a device, uh, um, a set of earbuds that say stopped working, maybe you spilled coffee on them, like I probably did to these, 
um, you can chop off, chop off this little end um, and plug it in the hole. And your computer will think that there's a set of earbuds plugged in there with a microphone and it will default to trying to listen through this when in reality, it's only listening to, to nothing. So if you have to take a device somewhere with you, but you wanna to try to make sure that it's microphone isn't listening, you can try this. Um, that, that should work for you if, that's, if you have to do that, if you can't leave your phone outside the room or, or your computer. Um, I, I put a picture here. There are some um, just, yeah, a, just a, it's just a cartoon drawing of that. You'll have it in the slides. Um, something to look for, because if you were to just plug in the one that has um, just the left and right for the, the listening through the earbuds, it wouldn't take control of the mic. Um, any questions about that or other um, sort of hardware physical ways you're controlling your, your cameras and microphones? Could I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what about, I, I don't have a phone that only requires like the wireless earbuds because I actually like the headphones, but for people who do have just the wireless ones, yeah. how would you prevent that and what, how, yeah, I don't understand yeah. how that works. That's a great question. So um, as, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but all wireless headphones that I've ever um, seen or used are communicating over Bluetooth. I'm not sure if anybody has any other methods at this point, but um, you could simply turn off Bluetooth sensing from your device to try to make sure it's not talking to anything that could talk to it on Bluetooth. Um, certainly phones would have, yeah, you could turn off Bluetooth there and on your computers. That's yeah. great. I didn't, I didn't realize they were on Bluetooth. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, good question. All right, and so there's another thing, which is we can manage these sensors through our software settings. Um, on a Mac, we access through we access this through our system preferences, and then the security and privacy preferences, and we can do it by application. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share my screen and show you that. So I'm using a Mac, and if I go to my system preferences, the privacy settings. Um, what you'll see is that camera and microphone are listed in here in my privacy settings. And the way that Mac organizes this is we allow different apps to have access to our mics or cameras. That'll be the same, that's true also of applications on phones, both on iPhones and on Android devices. So you can disable a, a specific application's access to these sensors. Um, I periodically will disable my Zoom, like access to the microphone and camera. And then what happens is the next time I try to join a Zoom call or meeting, Zoom itself will ask me if it can have access again. So again, if you're going into a conversation where you would really like your computer Try to, you're trying to make sure your computer isn't listening in as many ways as you can. Um, and you try to disable application access. Um, the next time you use those apps, it, it will ask you for access again. So it does, it's not disabling it forever. And cameras and microphones are controlled separately in Max. There's one more thing that we can do in a Mac. Um, this is not the same as turning off, but um, we can in our sound settings, there's a, there's a setting called input um, and you can choose a microphone that it's, that you, that's attached to your computer and adjust the volume at which it's, it's listening. So um, this is my internal microphone. And if I turn it up, it's listening louder and you can turn it all the way down so you can see it's sort of like muting. It's not the same as turning it off, but again, it's like one more software control that we have if, if you have to take your device in and you're trying to be careful. Let's see in the chat. Um, a question about which computers are better and worse. 
Um, uh, I think they're both about as controllable at this point. So if we're talking about Windows and Macs, I do think we have about the same kinds of controls on both. Um, my next slide is about oh, Windows. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have, I can't do a screen share on this because I don't have a Windows machine, but I'm gonna show you the support page. Oops, it's right here. If you are on a Windows machine, um, take a look at this documentation. There, um, Windows has a few a few items that I think we don't have on Macs. One is you can you can ask it to show you if the microphone or camera are on. It'll pop up a little icon in your in your menu bar. I like that. I think that's helpful. Most of us have little um, camera lights next to our cameras that would indicate if it's on or not. But if if a virus is written well enough to try to control your camera, it's probably going to be written also to try to not use that, not show you that light. So you really don't know if it's on. Um, so I like that about Windows, but again, if I'm going to write a virus to try to control your Windows devices, I'm going to try to override that menu alert as well. Um, and then let's see. You can also, and then in Windows also, there's there's information on, on that documentation page about turning on and off those microphone and camera for your different apps. Um, any other questions about cameras and mics? So the best way to control them is to cover them up, plug them up. Um, uh, I would suggest though, using all of these methods, if something is very, if a conversation is risky and you can't help bring your device in. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about biometrics next. Um, what are biometric sensors? Are you, and are you using them? So we talked a little bit when Dulani was saying, where is my biometric sensor? Or what might it look like? So, um, some phones and computers these days have a fingerprint biometric sensor. Biometrics um, is, uh, data that is uh, biologically encoded. So it's something about my body. It might be facial recognition and iris recognition, fingerprints, um, voice, voice recognition, um, where something can identify your voice, not just your words might work. Raj resisted at first, but caved in because of the convenience of Apple Pay. Yeah. I. Um, I think, especially when these first came out, I spoke with a lot of people who were using them. Um, the one thing is that for activists, these are really risky because um, we often find ourselves in, especially out at actions with our devices trying to document or with our devices as backup safety lines um, if we need to, uh, if we get into trouble and, um, or an unsafe situation. Um, and so for us, um, we need to be really thoughtful about carrying our devices and using biometric sensors if we're gonna be walking by people who might force us to use those, whether that's police or anyone at a checkpoint or um, just sort of like opposing political um, groups. So, um, I'm gonna change the share, the screen share. And I just okay. had one thing that yes. that really stick with me because I think that's such an important point you just made about documenting in, in some of the workshops that we do. I was like struggling a little bit to communicate that and really understand it. But my understanding now is that you can be compelled to give up your biometric data, like to unlock your phone by the police, but you can't be compelled to give like a numeric passcode because that's considered like knowledge versus um, biometric data or some, like physical information. And so that's why it's, you know, ex experts like you are recommending using a numeric passcode um, versus a thumbprint lock or face lock. So yeah, that's thanks. Be helpful to add. Totally. Yeah, in the US where it's technically our, our property, our password, um, whether that gets respected is um, based on probably the police person that you encounter. Um, but 
Absolutely. Um, so I, um, I did a little digging about biometrics because I think um, a big question for me was what about the technical security of biometrics? So this is one thing that's like socially, it's not a very secure tool for us as activists. But what about technically? Like, do I need to be concerned um, about it? And so something that's great about both Mac and Windows is that they're designed um, to carefully compartmentalize biometric data. So if you use, um, say, a fingerprint scanner on a Windows or a, an Apple device, only the fingerprint scanner can access that fingerprint data. And it's stored and um, encrypted and disaggregated in a way so that it couldn't be reverse engineered. So let's say someone takes your device, they couldn't recreate your fingerprint from the amount of data that's on that, the way it's stored. So those two things, to me, I think that settled some technical questions for me about it. I, they both also, both platforms um, commit to never um, backing up that data or, or sending it from your device or storing it anywhere. So it shouldn't be accessible um, to anyone who doesn't have your device. That's, um, that's a little bit, <laughs> that's, that's helpful, um, at least uh, for people who have low risk of carrying their device into space and being forced to, um, to uh, use their biometric locks. Um, and perhaps if you have a device at home that you like to use biometrics on or something, uh, yeah, uh, that, might, that might set some concerning things. Um, but again, for, for us, since we are activists, I think we should just be in the practice of turning them off and using passphrases, and like Jackie was saying too. So here's some, here's some instructions about how to turn them off. <laughs> on, um, on Mac, it's in your settings, in Touch ID, and on Windows machines, it's in your sign-in options. If you're an organization that, um, that's using Windows uh, across the organization, the administrator of your system can turn that on and off the biometrics. So if you are like, oh, but I, my whole office works on Windows and I don't know how to turn it off, I don't see the option. Um, it's your system admin who's gonna have access to turn it. And then the other thing to do is um, if you are ever giving away um, or selling or recycling your devices, be sure to reset and reformat your device before doing that. Um, this is for many reasons, but including to get to wipe off any of your um, any of your biometric data. Any questions? Just chat question. If you've given other apps your face ID or biometric data, do the other apps um, add, like own that data? So um, that's a really good question. I think it's gonna vary by the app. And so something like Facebook has been looking at photos that we post and tag and where we name ourselves and we name other faces, other people's names. And it's been building up a database of what people look like tagged with that name, right? So its facial recognition system is built on that data, not even scanning, um, not even a scan using a camera or something. It's based on tagging. Um, and so you kind of have to go app by app and, and, and try to figure out how it was building up its database. Um, and it might also be relying on a database that was built by someone else. So for instance, a Facebook has a, an extremely valuable um, database at this point of faces and names. Um, how to do this on Linux? Ooh, great question. Anybody else on Linux? Are you using bio, a biometric um, ID right now on it? Mm, I don't think so. I never turned anything on on it, okay. so. Um, we might, maybe I can follow up about that. What's the, what kind of device are you on? I don't. 
we can follow up on the later lab or something so i don't yeah. take up all the time that sounds good because i'm still learning my way around it too yeah did you just start using it oh, no <laughs> i started using it four years ago but i like right. stay within my comfort zone yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you cool um okay so we're going to move into metadata um so what is metadata? And I will tell you a spoiler alert. This is a picture from my camera phone that I took on the street the other day. And to the right is the metadata about it. What, can you read it? And can you see what information is over there in the metadata? Based on what's in this picture, what do you think metadata is? There's some information here. So in the general meta metadata bucket, it's like the color model. It used it was it's using RGB, the size, um, and this thing called EXIF. Um, there's a whole lot of data about specifically about the, the fact that it's a photo. So the aperture value, the brightness value, um, then a timestamp, the exposure time. So yeah, some more specifics to the fact that it's a, a, a photo. Um, there's a little, there's some GPS data there, the kind of GPS um, tagging that it was using. Um, and um, there's another there's another set of information that I could see here um, under TIFF. It's a, it's a TIFF file, um, and that information includes the date and time it was taken, as well as the fact that it was taken on a Motorola, and that the model of the Motorola was a, a Moto G five plus. Um, the kind of software, so the operating system version that I'm using. So metadata is actually data about data. Um, so if the data is the photo, all of this is information about the photo, right? It's like descriptive of the photo itself, like the, the pixel size and the, the way that it was taken um, with like the camera settings, the exposure time, the aperture size. Um, and it's also information about what device took it and when, um, and there's some GPS um, data on there too. So also where. Um, so our our um, our phones are capable of um, adding all of this information to videos and and photos, and um, and that could pose varying risks to us um, in your work and in your personal life. Do you think about metadata? Are there risks that you're concerned about with metadata? My least favorite part of this metadata. Oh, go ahead. No, I was. I'll share if no one else is, but I definitely, you know, it's similar since we work with a lot of photo and videos. Understanding that, uh, especially like GPS, um, can give away people's locations. Um, but we're also, since we're doing more work around information, misinformation, disinformation. Um, we're using metadata as a way to verify content sometimes and trying to understand like when and how it can be manipulated um, and, and things like that. And, and what other visual clues we could look for within the imagery that point to um, verifying the types of metadata. Like mm -hmm. if the sun is at a certain angle, does that help us understand what time of day it is? Stuff like that. Thanks. Yeah, I think that gets to this question of like, how risky is metadata to us? Um, there's plenty of information inside of a photo that that could give away any of these elements. It could give away your location. If you take a photo and say the Eiffel Tower is just to your right in the photo, <laughs> it would be pretty clear where you were as an, um, as an example. Um, um, 
and the the um, the things that we usually talk about as like the a first level of risk are definitely the GPS information. I think is um, could be quite risky for people at times. Um, I think the the make and the model of a phone um, to me is the most personal <laughs> um, when I look at this metadata. Um, I don't know that it's an actual much of a risk to me unless I say was posting a lot of photos and I had been trying to be anonymous and somebody was able to look at all the metadata on my photos and say, oh, this is coming from the same phone and then figure out that it was me. Um, so that would take a bit of work um, and isn't that much of a risk, but it feels quite personal. So some can strategies. A, sorry, yeah, can I ask go a ahead. quick question about the last slide, some of the metadata on there that is not familiar to me. Yeah. Um, where it says scene type, a directly photograph, and then I like dot, dot, dot. What, what is that? And is that something that's like automated? Yeah. Um, kind of like the longer yeah, image if, towards the bottom. Let me see if I can read the full, a directly photographed image. That's it. Um, I actually don't, I don't know what, yeah, why that tag ended up on there. Yeah, I have, I'm not familiar with that. And it looks like it's maybe using AI to assess what the image is of or something. I don't know, but I'm very curious. Yeah, or it might be because I did send it like directly from my phone. So maybe that's what the directly photograph okay. image means. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, some, so some tricks and strategies to, to edit and change your metadata. The first one is one that I learned from, from Jackie and from Polly, your colleague, which is to screenshot an image. So if I'm on my phone and I took a photo and I actually need to get it out, like it's really important for me to get it up and out, but I don't want it to be tagged with all of that information we just saw. You can take a screenshot of it. So there's still gonna probably be some information on there about like, certainly you have to be thoughtful about where you upload it and how you upload it, but it would remove the, at least the photographic metadata from it. It would turn it into a different kind of file. Um, you can edit metadata, metadata in software. Windows has the best tools for this actually, like built in in the property viewer. We'll take a look at some screenshots from that next. Um, it's quite easy to view properties and then delete um, metadata and, um, and edit it. In Mac, um, it's easy to view metadata. That's what we were just looking at. Um, and we'll see some screenshots about how to do that next also. Um, but in order for us to edit it, we, we usually have to open like specific software. So an example of software that's already built into your Mac, if you have a Mac, would be like iTunes. You can use that to edit the information or the metadata on a song track. Um, and similarly, iPhoto or whatever the photo, the built-in Apple photo software is, you can also edit metadata on that and then resave the file. Um, and then more expensive software also lets you do it. So definitely like the Adobe sort of photo editing suite lets you change metadata. For files of different types, like PDFs um, and Word documents, those applications also will let you save out with different metadata settings. So the PDF, um, I have a link in the slides about um, exporting and removing metadata from PDFs. Um, lawyers have to do this a lot when they're sending documents around. And so um, those, are, those are actually often the documents I refer to um, when looking for most updated information about like removing information about my computer, for instance, or from a PDF. Um, and then the more times you change the file, um, the, the more you, you'll be able to edit things too. So if I say, take a screenshot of a photo, send it to myself on a computer, export it as a PDF, and then take that metadata off the PDF, um, I'll, I'm pretty, I feel pretty certain about being able to see the metadata enough times and to scrub it a few times after it's gone through that many changes. Another thing we can do is we can turn off some of the metadata collection in the first place. Um, and the, 
the location is the piece that we can manage the most. Um, on iPhones, this is actually in your privacy settings. There's a whole setting, privacy settings for location. Um, and you can find your camera and turn on and off on the camera. On, your, on an Android device, you open up the camera app itself and in the settings on the camera app, um, you can turn off a feature that's called save location. So any photos that you would be taking um, then would not be saving that location data. Um, and then you can turn off location information in applications. So um, if, I, um, if I say turn off metadata collection on my phone, phone camera, but then I post that same photo to a platform where I'm automatically posting my location, then I've sort of undone the work that I was trying to do um, by not geotagging it. So make sure you're turning off those location settings on your applications as well. Um, a platform other. Um, and then there, there are some ways on your device itself to remove um, location data. Again, this is just location, um, but there's a, there's a link there as well that, um, that we'll post in the chat. So on Windows, um, is anybody here on a Windows machine? I think there are often not many of us. Okay. Um, well, just in case you end up on a Windows machine at some point, <laughs> here's the slide for it. There's um, You would just sort of right click um, the photo that you wanna look at the metadata for. And the bottom option on that menu will be properties. Um, when, when properties opens up, you'll see a window that looks like the second picture. You can click details. And we'll start to show you those details that we just looked at as an example on mine, the metadata. Um, and then you can remove properties um, by type of data. So on, um, on a Windows machine, you can get pretty specific. You could remove like just the date taken, for instance, but leave the rest. On a Mac, so what I just did was I open an image and you can do this on your Macs if that's what you're sitting in front of, open a picture um, and then choose, choose from tools, um, show inspector. And it will open up the, a window that says uh, more information. You can, and then you'll be able to tab through uh, the pictures, uh, the, the different parts of the information there are general, exif, GPS and TIFF. So um, the metadata for different types of files will show up with different options there when you look at more information. Um, if you are using, if you're looking at a photo or a video, you'll see EXIF information. Um, and um, we see TIFF here because this file is a TIFF, but if it were a different type, um, you'd see a different type of file here as well. So there's metadata attached to things that are not just photos and videos. And again, we can't automatically remove stuff on Windows, or I mean, sorry, on Mac machines when we view it, um, we'd have to open up a different program. Is anyone using any other, there are third party um, uh, metadata remover removal tools. Some of them are online where you can sort of upload a photo and then we download it. Some of them you install on your own machine. Is anyone using any that you like? I've used like some EXIF reader things that you can, where you just, like you said, upload the tool and then I forget what it's called. It's EXIF something that you just use in command line. Um, that allows you to do it more easily with video. Uh, but I usually have to have someone walk me through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look online, there, there are recommendations. I, um, I, haven't, I haven't vetted any like third-party tools, so I wanted to, to only recommend things that, are, that either come installed or that are, um, that are available through software that we would have vetted already. So software like um, if you're using the Adobe Suite or, or like the the set of apps that come on a, a Mac device already. Okay, uh, sorry, 
So that was metadata. Other questions about metadata? Thank you. I think another, uh, sorry, another thing to talk about is when we upload a photo, if you upload a photo with a lot of metadata that's already attached to it, um, trying to figure out if on your application, who's gonna see that metadata. So um, at this point, uh, most of the time, like I think the default tends to be if I upload a photo that has a lot of metadata, it might get uploaded to the platform and the platform itself might read that or store it somewhere, but most other users won't be able to see it unless I enable that. Um, okay, so then I, I want to dig into memory a little bit. Um, this is, um, it's just, I just wanted to take some time to like point out different places that, that our computers store information and different ways that we have access to it or not. Um, so um, there, uh, is anybody thinking already about managing risks of um, data that's either stored on your device or on your removable media? Does anybody encrypt removable media like your memory cards or hard drives? Time machine, yeah, back encrypting time machine backups. Yeah, and we talked on Tuesday about um, full disk encryption, which is encrypting the hard drive on my phone or on my computer. Um, and so hard drive, yes, removable drives, no. Yeah, it is actually possible to encrypt our, um, you know, the tiny memory card that we put into our phone. Um, it's possible to passcode lock our SIM cards, which also store some memory, have some memory on board. Um, and it's possible to encrypt um, almost anything that we plug in at this point, whether it's a hard drive or a thumb drive um, or just a, a, car, a memory card that we slide into our computer or plug in. Um, and that is a good, that's a good idea because um, generally the, the information from the sensors is getting stored on the hard drives, but um, to the extent that we're storing some of these files sometimes on removable media also, uh, we can take care of it that way. Um, you can at least set passwords on your devices, um, your applications and your SIM cards. Um, and another thing to do that's um, that um, we're gonna do is take um, make a list, like start to look about, sorry, start to think about um, where we might be storing sensitive information on our devices and trying to figure out how we can locate where it's being stored. So we'll do that now. Um, we've been talking mostly about photos and videos um, and, um, and that might be sort of the riskiest information on our, our devices, um, but there might be some other information too. So we're gonna take a moment and step back and think about where, where these things are stored. Um, and practice managing our memory a bit. So um, the first thing to, that we're gonna do is um, make a list of high-risk information. That might be your, your videos and your photos. Um, it might be metadata. It might be photos or video that you receive from other people. Um, or it might be things like call logs. So we've done this process a few times together, and this is a this is risk assessment. Um, the next piece after thinking about um, what information is, um, is important to us that might be sensitive to us, we now do an assessment piece where we think about, well, who might try to access this? Um, what would the impacts be to me if that happened? And how likely are they to succeed? So 
how many resources do they have? How much time or how good are they? Or how much power do they have to get into my device? Um, um, because we might find that um, some of this information, um, actually nobody would try to get to. Um, so we can, we, um, and some of this information might be really valuable to others as well. Um, some information might be easier or harder to get to. And we do that assessment so that we can um, prioritize what we take care of first. Um, this is a question I get a lot, like, do I really have to delete all of these things? And my response is always, only if, um, only if it matters and you have to go through a process like this to figure out if it matters to you. Um, and these things might change over time. The people who are trying to get access might get more resources or there might be more people who would benefit from trying to break into your device or something. Um, or it might become more likely because you're going out, you're leaving the house more with your device or something. Um, okay, and then, so this is gonna vary also, but for, for each of those pieces of information, we have to, on our phones, especially um, these days, we have to locate where that is being stored. And it's probably being stored in a couple of places. There's probably a copy somewhere on our device. And then there's a, probably a copy that's accessible through our app, whatever app we were using to, do, to share or send or create that data. Um, I actually think the photos and videos are the easiest, um, the easiest ones to locate often because we're using the app that's built into our phone, if, we're, if we are. Um, if we are using a, an app like Instagram to take the photo, then what you'll find is that um, there's a copy, there's like Instagram storage on your phone. Um, so managing this risky memory, uh, the first thing to do after identifying it is to locate it, then back it up. We've talked about this a lot too, but make a copy of that um, somewhere that has adequate privacy and safety for yourself that isn't on that same device. Um, and then delete it from all of the locations that it happens to be in on, on that, um, on your device, if it's too risky to walk around with. So these aren't high tech um, solutions. <laughs> They're just processes really for us to, I like this whole thing has just been about processes of identifying, like thinking about too, right? Because um, these devices didn't always have this much information, like apps didn't always work this way on our devices. So we didn't always have to think about oh, where might this information be stored around or uh, around my device. Um, we didn't always have GPS. We didn't always have access to the GPS satellites. So we didn't all, always automatically have that tagged on them. Our photos. Any questions about this? Have you, have you already, do you already do this? Like, is there any data that, let's say, before you go out to a protest or something that you always delete? I'm, I always delete my call my call logs. I just do that periodically throughout a week. Not that I get that many calls these days, but I used to like just always just in, be in the habit of it because um, it just is, is, it has zero use for me, I found. And so I would rather not have it there than have it there. Um, yeah, call logs and text. It's the same with me for text messages as well. Like I don't, I, I do talk to people who feel like they rely on text message threads as, as a reminder of a conversation or, um, and so sometimes people need to keep them around or want to for that reason. But for me, it's not how I use text or chat. And I'd rather just not have a digital version of a conversation um, kept in memory. So I delete those frequently as well. Sometimes social media messages. Yeah, uh, sure. Cool. Some, yeah, call logs, texts, browser history on phone and computer. All right, um, some of our apps and computers also let us um, opt uh, choose to not store this in the first place. So you can use, you can set your browser to not remember your browsing history. You can set 
some chat apps to not remember chats after a certain period of time. Um, and choosing those can sort of eliminate the step. You don't have to delete. Yeah, that's what I do with browsers. Okay. So that's I just um, that's it for the devices that that we most commonly use our phones and computers. Um, and I wanted to take one step back before we um, before we stop talking about sensors, though, and think about the environments around us. So in your environment right now, and I would suggest doing the same thing where draw a picture of like the room that you're in and any other devices in your room, include your computer and your phone and any other devices in there that have sensors that have things like cameras or microphones, or even um, some light bulbs are on Bluetooth at this point. Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth would be a communication sensor as well. Um, there are other sensors that have been around maybe longer like motion sensors. Um, What else? Even thermostats have, um, they have a temperature sensor on them, at least sometimes they have a motion sensor. So when, as you look around yourself, did you find any other cameras and microphones? I'm at my in-laws, so I'm not totally sure what's around, but I'm not seeing other, anything other than a TV and like DVD player. Okay. Is there, is there a camera in that TV? It doesn't look like it. I mean, it's not like a touch screen. I don't know. I haven't actually, I guess I'm not too familiar with TVs that have cameras in them. Yeah. I don't think that's what it is. Anyone else find any cameras or microphones that you can identify? So that's good if no. A remote any, control. Does, remote control. Those, yeah, they have one of those remote controls you can talk into. Oh, hey, there you go. There's a microphone, portable mic. <laughs> Totally. I have a pe peculiar circumstance of my landlord um, having cameras that collect audio basically at every window of our home, which is, yeah. <laughs> oh. I had to, I had to uh, lay down some rules around that. And luckily Illinois where I live has some good privacy, well, okay privacy laws so I was able to say you need to take the ones out from my bedroom window okay. <laughs> um, but but yeah um, unfortunately because the landlord is the property owner you know and I'm a renter it's tough yeah yeah thinking about that too now I I know my landlord has he's my neighbor he has a camera that faces like their back door which is facing my like back patio <laughs> and then the cameras and just like on our street um around the building I remember they were like oh you're safe we have cameras security cameras and I was like oh I don't know you're gonna you can see every time I come home <laughs> and like yeah oh wow yeah I, for, I, I I realized that I also like kind of made myself forget about them like yeah. at first they're creepy and then later you get used to them. Yeah. Yeah, I've had that experience of like um, when I was still in Brooklyn of the, just my landlord over time installing more and more cameras places. Um, yeah. It's not illegal there. 
I think it might, I, um, it might really, there was a question, isn't that illegal? I think it might really depend on the location, like, um, Yeah, so definitely once we get outside of our rooms and to the exteriors of our buildings, we often can quickly identify cameras. Um, if we're in cities, there is a lot of sort of shot spotter or like micro, um, directional microphone, omnidirectional microphones around that police use. Um, and then even further out, there's often sensors in things like um, in things like traffic lights um, to sort of, uh, first and foremost, to check to see if cars have driven through under red, uh, through red lights, but then they also maybe have some other technologies on them. Like they might have a camera on it to also take a photo of that car. Um, oh, that your neighbors have an Amazon ring doorbell. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I just wanna be having this conversation more with people as we work from home. The first thing is, we are very used to taking care of our own devices. I think, you know, even if you're not putting in all of these practices, um, as activists, we even can share like, oh, but actually sometimes when there's a really important meeting, we do try not to bring it or we do think about it. But I think, um, yeah, we're all working from home. And I've, you know, I, I know that when I ask people to do this and they look around, sometimes there is a device right nearby that um, that is enabled. Maybe it's Maybe it's like a speaker or, uh, yeah, remote control or something. And I think we need to be thinking about keeping those outside of um, listening range as well. Um, there, again, they will have controls that are hardware-based and software-based. So you might be able to put it under 20 pillows um, or turn it off um, on its um, through software, but probably just um, at least identifying them first and then getting out of their, their view is, um, uh, the best we can do for things that we don't have control over. Some smart TVs are recording devices, absolutely, and you can you can physically cover cameras on those. I am um, curious the the ring thing. I hadn't really considered, but in the you know, there's the like wiretapping laws where some states you need both parties consent to record something versus most states where you only need one party. And I know Illinois is a two party consent state. So how is that legal for, are, are, are you consenting by signing a lease? That is something that I looked into too. And, and quite frankly, feel really sort of powerless about. Um, I, I think it could be a situation where I could sue, but I don't have, the, the money or a, or a lawyer <laughs> or a, or any idea of how to even begin that process um yeah it's I hadn't really even thought about like the whole reach of things like rings where they are recording in those states and like a, a maybe maybe a like post office worker is consenting by the nature of their job and something like that but they're being recorded and certainly not giving explicit consent. So I don't, I just, sorry, my head just kind of went yeah. down that path because I hadn't really thought about all the extrapolations of that issue. Yeah, there's certainly no shortage of surveillance cameras in Chicago, despite, yeah. Well, I think it's the audio specifically, I guess. Ah, and okay. maybe Ring doesn't record audio, but I I'm, don't know, I haven't, Never used one, but maybe that's how it gets around it. Huh. I don't know. Sorry. Just <laughs> no, no, no. got down a wormhole. Um, yeah, I, that was, that's it. I mean, the, yeah, so this whole, the whole theme of this workshop is identifying sensors, um, and then trying to figure out how we can control them manually and in software. Um, and then if they do have, if we can't, and they are storing um, data, then, it, then learning where they're storing that data and how to manipulate the data, whether we're deleting it or trying to change characteristics of it, like the metadata. Um, the one thing that we that um, we are sort of leaning into, and I, 
we have a little bit more time, but I, I do want to hear from folks. Um, are there uh, the other way, of course, to uh, manage the risks of uh, data being collected are to work on privacy and consent laws. Is anybody working on any campaigns or know about any right now that we could get involved in? Media Justice has the, do you all have? Protect Black Descent, is that? That's anti-surveillance. Yeah, it's like, um, it's anti-surveillance, it's um, urging uh, Congress to, to defund, um, to uh, talk about the Black entity ex extremists and uh, labeling, um, and to, to defund um, the agencies that are conducting this. Um, it's a great question though, in terms of specific like privacy and data consent stuff. I mean, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what, what some of the other, like I know of people's work and I don't know how much there's like a legal ad advocacy component to it. Like um, the data justice work that um, Data for Black Lives um, mm -hmm. folks are doing. I know the um, Amnesty US and uh, Stop um, NYPD spying in in New York is has a campaign around banning facial recognition on surveillance cameras and and police devices. Um, I think I can grab a link real quick. And they're actually working with like volunteers to map the security cameras around the city so that they can create kind of a, a reference for people to understand like where their identity might be um, picked up. Nice. All right. Does anybody have any questions? It could be related to um, directly to things we talked about or just things that are coming up about sensors and your devices. All right. Um, well, in order to close out, uh, just ask that you share, um, maybe unmic yourself and share what's one thing you're leaving here with today. Um, I'm happy to share. I always appreciate learning from you and I love your hack for um, the microphone, the cutting that off and using that as a plug in the in the mic uh, plug. So thank you for that. I had never heard of that before. Thank you. Thanks. I feel like I'm walking away generally feeling like I've got, I, I have things I can do to lower, you know, this feeling of being heard or sensed. Um, so it, it like, I don't like feel powerless against it. Or if folks feel that way that I like talk with or something, it's like, well, there's actually a lot of different hacks and things you can do if, if you want to. So I, I like, I like how you approach this and how you teach and share all these little skills and practices. Great, that's great. <laughs> Alex, leaving with more awareness on what my metadata can be used for and ways to limit it.
anyone else still here. So um, I echo the the more awareness. I think wanting to figure out the powers of my smart TV <laughs> and um, uh, also um, the internal microphone volume being turned down. That was super helpful too. Yeah, thank you. Great, well, there are a few folks who have not shared. If you would like to share by chat, feel free. And then thank you all for your time and yeah, for sharing and participating and thanks for coming back. Um, we are gonna do a couple more like brown bag sessions in the future, probably in September now. Um, and what we'll do for those is MJ will send around some like a questionnaire asking people if there's anything specific that you've been trying to work on or other questions that you've had. Um, uh, if, yeah, if you raise issues through that um, questionnaire uh, process, then we can address those directly. Uh, thanks, Raj. I'm walking away comfortable knowing that I've been taking the precautions that I can, and I'm concerned for the lack of privacy concerns of my family members. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Access Team. Yeah, we'll definitely share these presentations. Awesome, I think it's just our internal team. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I will stop.